All right, so welcome uh, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amy Consalvi. I am the Director of Education at the Museum of Russian Icons. And I am joined today by Marina Smirnov, owner of Finnis Design. Uh, for those of you who are hoping to visit the museum in person soon, um, I'm happy to announce that we are officially reopening on Friday, March 5th. Um, it still will be by reservation. Um, so you can visit our website and learn more about that process and sort of all the protocols that we have in place. Place. Uh, so for today's lecture, we will be exploring Russian bath rituals, um, which I think is perfect considering this cold, snowy day. So hopefully you all have a nice hot cup of tea with you, um, and we can all just sit back and listen to uh, Marina's wonderful lecture that I've had the pleasure of hearing once before. Uh, so Marina Smirnov was born in the former USSR. From an early age, she showed an interest in art and an aptitude in creativity, which allowed her to complete a rigorous art-related curriculum in one of St. Petersburg schools. She then complemented her education in Russia by completing another four-year degree program at the Massachusetts, Massachusetts College of Art. Despite slowly transitioning to a career related to IT and software development, her passion for art and creativity remains. It is this interest to create, which coupled with having sensitive skin and having a young son who also has sensitive skin, led her to start making quality small batch handmade soaps in her very own home laboratory, aka the kitchen. After many trials and some errors, she has mastered the art of formulating new soap recipes and uses her creative freedom to craft soaps of various colors, designs, and medicinal qualities. All of the products she makes, starting from the soaps and candles and finishing with bath salts and lip balms, bear the hallmark of being tested and having beneficial effects on the health and the appearance of skin. So with that, I will turn it over to Marina. Thank you, Emmy. And uh, thank you also for proposing that we'll see everybody's faces because it's so lovely to be introduced, I feel like almost uh, to all of you in person because uh, we, kind of, you know, like nowadays we have to adjust to the digital environment. But again, the beauty of being together, see each other uh, and kind of share the same interest and passion is really important. So feel free, you know, you can stop me uh, pretty much at any point if you have additional questions or maybe at the end of each section, I'll pause. And um, again, if you have like a particular interest, share it with me. Or at the end, we also leave uh, some time for questions. With that, again, I think Amy gave a really good overview of who I am. Uh, but I just want to share uh, one more thing before we begin. It's truly kind of my passion um, to, to, first of all, like learn about the history and something that connects to like Russian roots. And again, to something that we can bring to the current present time. If we can learn from our ancestors, you know, what, what was done and was done successfully back then, how we can bring it to present time. So that's where I also want to leave you at the end with some of the tips or some of the ideas uh, from, you know, the history lessons or something that we can do, you know, even in our kitchen. With that, uh, let me start by also going over uh, what we'll be covering today. I wanted to start uh, with giving that kind of brief introduction of the history of soap and soap making in general. Then, uh, again, my favorite part, uh, we'll talk about the bathing rituals in Russia how it all started, uh, how it was elevated throughout the time and how it was also mixed with some of the religious beliefs and you know pagan times with all those rituals before Christian times and how it was all like intermediate or combined and how it survived to the present day. Then also covering industrial production and use of soap in Russia and the reason why it was so popular and how it was different in terms of popularity compared to European countries. Then another great topic for everybody to understand uh, the nature and how the synthet synthetic soap alternatives were created. Why? Why they become so popular? And when you go to the grocery store, if you're looking for the bar of soap, are you truly getting a soap or is it a detergent? And I'll help you to, to, to differentiate one kind from the other. And uh, at the end, 
uh, covering the benefits of natural soap, how you can choose your own ingredients and how you can actually create soap at home. Or when you start looking for a good soap in the market, you'll know how to differentiate one from the other or what ingredients you should be looking for, or how, we, how we can even read the label to know like this is, this is exactly what you need. And of course, questions at the end. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. So origins of soap making. Uh, the more I was learning about it, the more interesting it becomes because it goes back to the ancient Babylon time. And nobody knows exactly when the soap was discovered. There are different legends that surround the discovery. One of the legend that uh, the name soap came from the ancient name of Mount Sapo. And it comes from, you know, those rituals, you know, the burning of the animals and the, when the rain come down and that mixture of ashes and fats combined into the greasy substance, people discovered that greasy substance truly helped to make clothes to be brighter and to help with decreasing and removing any kind of, you know, big stains or dirt patches. So the way how soap was discovered, it was might say like purely by accident. And when it's the first use of soap was not for cleaning bodies, but for medicinal use or actually not for cleaning bodies, not for, you know, kind of the body use, but for actually washing clothes or for, or for medicine. And another interesting fact that originally soap wasn't in the form that we used to seeing it today. It was that semi-liquid substance that was usually uh, stored in a clay, um, kind of clay containers or something where it could be contained and, and used as needed. And that was also, you know, the, what interesting, another kind of um, thought from where the name soap came from, from the Latin word sebum, which means fat or tallow. Because again, originally the soap was created by uh, using animal fats. And only later on in the seventh century, olive oil was one of the main ingredients or became one of the main ingredients. Uh, after the fall of Rome in 467 uh, AD, bathing habits declined throughout the Europe. That what created unsanitary conditions, actually leading to um, some of the peak of the Black Death, for example. But what's interesting again, that uh, in Slavic cultures or Arab cultures, use of soap continued to be very popular. And those secrets, uh, when it came to kind of the, the Russian culture came from uh, Byzantine Empire. And they inherited and from Roman Empire. So also in another interesting historical fact that excavation of Pompeii, that's where um, few houses where soap was created and boiled were discovered. So again, just the kind of a compliment to all the bathing houses throughout uh, Italy and throughout the Rome in general, you can imagine that how popular it was at that time. Some of the recipes were lost, some of the recipes were inherited, but uh, by the seventh century, soap making was established in Italy primarily in Spain and France. And that's where the use of olive oil was one of the uh, key ingredients. It always was one of the base ingredients for creating soap. Later on, that soap production was spread to German and England. But it was still uh, yet that traditional manufacturing process that came even from Roman time, how the soap was creating by mixing ashes and any kind of, of oil. It could be vegetable oil or it could be fat, tallow or any kind of oily substance. 
And even the, it's not truly ashes that you're mixing, but the substance called potash. It's when you're pouring water over ashes, that's when that substance that, that contains lye with the combination of any type of fat would create soap. And that was perfect, was perfecting over time. By Nicolas Leblanc in 1791, he actually the one who discovered the process of turning ordinary table salt into sodium carbonate, soda ash. And that was a huge discovery because before 19th century, soap considered to be really expensive and I would say luxury item. Not so many people can afford to purchase a bar of soap because if you can imagine the process of creating a soap was very complicated and very expensive and time consuming. You have to have abundance of forest or any kind of wood to create ashes. Then you have to have oil and you know that constant supply of water. So all those factors are really important in creation of soap. And then knowing the secret of all the proportions were also important because if you're adding too much lye, the soap would burn your skin. If you're not adding enough, it wouldn't clean you properly or it would be too liquidish or it wouldn't be pleasant even in appearance. So that's why, and, and again, like it was, you know, since, you know, those materials were really hard to gather, there was no manufacturing process that could have been established before that discovery by, by Nicolas Leblanc, as I said, you know, that was one of the, um, that, that, you know, the soul only really rich people can afford. Uh, also in, um, 1807, sodium uh, hydroxide, which is nowadays known by lye, was discovered. That was another big discovery that would lead into creating like more a manufacturing and a bigger production scale of soap. And the whole kind of advertisement and uh, explaining the benefits of using soap was primarily promoted by Louis Pasteur. He truly explained the importance of, you know, cleaning yourself, <laughs> like the, the, the basic hygiene and pretty much the habits that we know nowadays, uh, something that considered absolutely normal was more like a unique um, circumstances, let's say in medieval times. So that's how we kind of came to the full circle, starting from the Roman ancient time when soap was discovered, when bathing rituals were so important and was part of the daily routine into mid-century where people are abstaining actually from, from water washing themselves. Because if you can imagine like water in rivers in, you know, mid-centuries or, you know, that the uh, 15, 13, 14th century, you know, wasn't considered to be clean because, you know, everything was dumped into the rivers. So that's why it was another kind of reason for not, you know, using that water and of course, not even like, you know, needing the soap to wash yourself. And then going back, actually moving to the 18th and 19th century, when the importance of soap were coming back, and people who can afford it start using it. And also that uh, almost, uh, you know, inspiration and, and, and going, um, looking into what was uncovered in, in Italy, in, especially when Pompeii were digged up, that was a kind of spike, another interest in going back to Roman times. So it wasn't only fashion, but also some of the things that people were learning and uncovering that brought back that use of soap again. Any questions so far? Okay, 
So moving to one of my favorite subjects, which I love to discuss, that again, like feel free to jump with any questions or maybe something that you've been experiencing in the past or something you wanted to learn more about bathing rituals in Russia. And something that I mentioned previously that the use of soap in Russia actually wasn't declining so dramatically in comparison to uh, some of the European countries. Because that tradition and kind of the history of soap making was inherited from the Byzantine Empire. And the, and the bathing houses were created even at the beginning of, uh, I would say like the, the first record was probably the fifth century, but even the early stages, how instead of the houses, there are some tents that people were using. And within those tents, the water was boiled and the stones were heated. So it was the first kind of creation of that bathing house um, in the terms of, you know, that, that how it was used and kind of that, that originations for, you know, what was happening later. In the 10th century, that was the first official record of banya. And the word banya means sauna in, in you know, the common terms that know nowadays. And the key difference between sauna and Russian banya, that in Russian banya, uh, it, it was used the combination of heated stones and the water or steam. So the air is not as dry, but it's really humid. And there are two different types of bani exist, even up to present time. One was called uh, the water in a black way and the bani in a white way. And the black way, that's uh, where there is no chimney. And the smoke would go through the door. So the process of heating up a starting bunny was slightly different because you're making a fire and you're heating up all the stones that sit inside that brick, you know, it's like wooden structure and, you and you're waiting for uh, the stones to heat up. And then if you can imagine everything inside is covered with ashes. So it's pretty dark. And in some cases, you know, you have to be careful because it might not be safe. Um, since, you know, like that, you know, you, you have to wait a certain period of time to make sure that you have enough oxygen to breathe inside. But that was the most affordable way, if you can imagine, and the easiest way to create a structure and in how you can heat it up. Another uh, that was kind of an evolution, a big progression and step forward, how uh, a different type of banya was invented. When you're truly using a chimney and you doing a masonry structure that would allow you to heat those stones as well, but uh, all the smoke would go outside, only leaving the heated stones, clean heated stones inside. And then again, a combination of water that was poured over those stones, that would create an extremely humid heat inside. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that the word banya came from a Latin word, balneum meaning something to make pain and sadness to go away. And most of the people truly believe that banya is not only helping to cure some of the physical illnesses, but it helps for your mental health. Because when you're going in, you're not only cleaning yourself outside, you're also cleaning yourself inside. And the different alternations in temperature truly helps to free up your mind. So if you can imagine you're going back 
and you're sitting in this hot environment with the human air when it's really cold and snowy outside and then you're going outside and you're jumping into a frozen lake. So there is also that benefit of alternating different temperatures that helps uh, with contracting your blood vessels. That is also known, you know, and that was later discovered and supported by some other uh, medicinal observations and later on was also documented. And we have like a proven example, yes, it's great for your health, but back then all people know that you have to use banya daily or at least weekly, because that's how you can benefit, especially during winter time, how you can gain back your strength and clean inside and be clean inside out. So that's why there's also like certain rituals and beliefs that I'll touch upon a minute, a few minutes later, uh, that the people discover you need to follow. That's why, you know, also some of the sayings in Russia, they're very common. For example, you know, uh, the day you spend in Banya is the day you do not age. Because it's truly to be believed that you're gaining back your young, your spirit when you go to Banya. And actually, you should, if you've never done it yourself, you should try it. <laughs> Uh, there are a few places, I'm not sure about Massachusetts, but there are definitely a few places in Canada where you can go and truly experience different types of Vanya. The black way, as I discovered, and the white way as well. Uh, another attribute, if you ever decide to go to the Vanya, you should know, you should definitely use, um, in Russia it's called Venik. Uh, it's that kind of a bath broom that you can make yourself or you can purchase it. And the benefit of this bath broom that, again, it helps to move the air inside, uh, inside Banya. It can become more, more heated. You can feel like, you know, that the certain area of your body would need more heat than the other. But it also helps to open the pores. And um, it's also a type of kind of massage, <laughs> depending who's doing it. So also to be found very beneficial. Uh, what interesting, during the time of Peter the Great, a lot of Europeans came to Russia. And one of the things that they observed if how, how Russian people are using banya and how they're using those bath brooms. And at first they were frightened by the appearance because if you can imagine one people is hitting the other <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it, 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 was, uh, it, it was something that was like, that Europeans found fascinating, but after experiencing it themselves, and understanding the benefits, they start to change in their mind. What, what appears more frightened to them then became out of like more curious and something that they decided they want to try. And some of them discovered the, the experience very pleasant at the end. But do, don't forget, it's not only about how you use the body, but the combination of all those rituals that you have to start by rinsing yourself with water, then sitting in the heated room, and then jumping in the cold pond or lake. So all those alternations truly help for your body to, 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 to go through different temperatures and come back to be clean and rejuvenated. Another, I would say, uh, and again, like not to, I, I was mentioning earlier that that effect of alternating cold and hot temperatures later on 
was uh, were confirmed by some of the doctors, European doctors, or some of the priests that are working around how to improve overall health of well-being. And if you go, if you ever been to Czech Republic, there are a whole series of spas um, where that um, that ritual, I would say, or the effect of alternating hot and cold temperatures now became also a very popular destination. And if you ever heard the word knape therapy, so that's where it came from. It's based on the Bavarian priest whose name was Sebastian Kneip, and he actually dis, uh, confirmed that theory of you know combining alternating hot and cold water and how you benefit from it. In in his uh, study, he was primarily used if you're stepping into different streams of water. So body, in one sense, your whole body is emerged either in really hot environment and humid, or when you're jumping into the lake again, you're all submerged into water. But in, in, in terms of, you know, Kneeb's uh, discovery, it was when you're stepping and just uh, with your feet and alternating hot streams and cold streams of water. Do you have any questions? So we can then move on to talk about uh, Russian folklore and also some of the traditions um, that was actually later converted into some of the fairy tales or some of the beliefs that people are still, you know, like my grandmother, she still believes in all those creatures that live inside our house or inside the banya. And she's very religious in terms of following certain traditions. With that, I wanted to start, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's a fairy tale. I think it's a strong belief that um, first of all, like every house in Russia uh, have some kind of a spirit that lives inside. And that spirit called uh, the Mavoy, meaning it's somebody who lives inside a house and taking care of all the possessions inside and watching over the people who's living there. And to emphasize that the banya was considered to be a really important place in the Russian household, a special creature believed to live inside banya as well. That person was called banyik. That was a capricious and sometimes harmful spirit. He was highly respected, but at the same time, People were, um, he's not as, um, uh, I would say he's not as good as nature as, let's say, the household spirit, the one that lives inside the house. He was more on the edge of be evil, but still highly respected, as I mentioned. People believe that the Bani can tell stories and that he can predict future. So during that winter time, and again, that going back to the pagan times, that's how you know the pagan rituals was later on uh, combined almost and, and converted uh, into a new, new way of thinking. I would say, because in, in the terms of Christianity came to, to Russia, it still found its existence in the, in the pagan rituals. And the, the way how you know, the pagan rituals were so embedded into every, everybody's day-to-day -day activity that uh, in combination of, you know, all, all the kind of the church rituals, it created almost like a new theme. So in this case, uh, the Yuletide, it's when it's happening, um, 
I believe that was that time right after Christmas, but uh, the, the, the first week after Christmas, that's when young girls were trying to predict their future. That's where they would go to Banya, and that's where all the, those rituals uh, were happening. And they were like, again, different types. Some of them, you would have a bowl of water and then they have a candle. You were dripping candle backs into the water and then taking whatever, you know, kind of, you know, shapes were created in the cold water, looking at the light or through the light and looking at the shadow. You can start reading and using, using your imagination kind of foreseeing what would come your way during the upcoming year. Another way of predicting future was when you're putting two mirrors in front of each other and you're kind of looking in one, but you're seeing the other behind. So you're creating a tunnel. And at the end of the tunnel, uh, you'll see also different types of shapes or shadows, because also imagine you have all the girls standing behind you, you have the candles burning, and you also have this um, kind of the overall idea that you're in a secret place and that uh, the creature, you know, that the binding might observe you. If you think about like how everything was created that moment, in the moment of time, that's where, of course, you know, your imagination can, you can see other things that you might not see in the regular circumstances. Going back to that, that interesting creature, you know, the banyik, the, 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 the spirit of banya, people also believe that uh, because banyik, he was, he, he lived more in, the, in that realm of like evil spirits and pagan beliefs that you shouldn't really bring any Christian symbols into Banya. So if, if you have a cross on your chest, you should leave it outside. And another reason for that, if you think from the logical standpoint, because inside the body, it might be so hot, you can burn yourself. So any kind of metal around your neck is not safe. Another thing that you shouldn't use banya alone or you shouldn't use banya at night when you're alone. Because people believe that banya can do something, something you know, harmful happen to you. And again, from the logical standpoint, it makes sense because when you're sitting alone in a really, you know, in a heated room with a high temperature, it's better to have somebody else near you just to watch over you to make sure you're okay. But that's how all the superstitions are happening and how you know, all those rituals were created. And others believe that you should use banya three times, that you should go inside only three times because otherwise it might be harmful to your body. Or in, in old beliefs, it will be harmful because Banyik would do something to you. And because Banyik was such a respect, respectful creature, people were, were done with bathing rituals and the bathing overall. They were leaving some gifts outside. And one of those gifts might be a tiny piece of soap. Because again, remember at that time, soap was a pretty expensive um, item, or it could be a piece of bread with salt, again, just to show that respect and thankfulness for using banya and for banya to be, to allowing them for this ritual to go through and being successful. Another interesting fact that even so the banya was standalone structure, usually really well built, if you're visiting somebody and let's say there limited space inside the house, nobody ever supposed to sleep inside the banya. So banya considered to be left alone so that spirit can have its space. 
So you would either rather sleep uh, in the barn or sleep outside, but never inside the banya. Any, any other questions or in, anything that uh, you want me to cover more deeply? Or if you, if you heard something, heard about certain superstition uh, that you're curious about, I'm happy to answer. Okay, then moving on, and you can you can you know keep your questions till the end. I will be happy to go back and, and cover some of the other topics. So industrial production um, soap in Russia. As I mentioned previously, that the bathing rituals in Russia are really important. It was important to the you know um, it, it never you know it never declined. So people are bathing on, you know, at least, you know, twice a week. And it was still common, not only, you know, it was, it was common in, in the bigger cities or in the small villages. That's why production of soap took such an important place in Russia. And the, the, the start of the production, uh, the moment, you know, the production, uh, the bigger production and manufacturing processes was actually uh, established by Peter the Great. He was looking into finding optimal location where there was a, would be abundance of natural resources, such as wood and oil. And that place was found uh, that, that place was actually the town of Shuya. And if you look on the map, it, it might appear to be in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> but actually because it's been situated on the river and there are plenty of forests that was surrounding it, it was easy to bring resources. There are no, never shortage of wood. And if you can see kind of that symbol on, on the right hand side, the, that symbol of the city contains what you'll see in the bottom. That's actually the bar of soap. That, that's how that, you know, that, that city overall was known, you know, that was the center of production for all my majority of soaps that would, was sold throughout Russia. And some of the unique soaps were created there because if you can imagine, uh, if we talk about Italian or French soap, the main ingredients of those soap were olive oil. But in, in Russia, there are no olive trees. So there are some other ingredients that were used, such as tallow or animal fat, or actually in some cases it was uh, almond, almond milk or almond substance. Another interesting ingredient that were used, it was uh, also, you know, that the um, kind of that combination of uh, natural resources, finding natural herbs and clays, that was what also introduced and brought into soap. And that made that soap unique as well. Another, very unique ingredient was using the, also using the tar and adding to the soap creates very distinct smell, but also allowing for the extra cleaning ability. And if you're using it in combination of uh, applying it to like washing your hair with it, that would also use also like medicinal use of that type of soap because it would help to remove dandruff. It would help to, uh, you know, with the oily hair and some, some, some other issues. So it was almost like a prescriptional soap that some doctors would give to their patients. Another uh, really interesting fact that one of the famous uh, producers of soap that was happening in the 19th century 
Uh, his name was Henry Brocard. An interesting fact how he started, he started almost with nothing. And the reason why uh, his manufacturing was so effective and popular, because he decided to cut the price of the soap, not only in half, it was, uh, you know, probably he, he started selling like 10 times cheaper than any of his competitors. So that was, uh, he was trying to appeal to every layer of society. And he was compensating by selling more expensive luxury items to the upper class and making more affordable to lower class people. Then he went even further. He was exploring how to spark interest. And he started making uh, soap in the shape of cucumber. And the people were buying his soap just out of curiosity because it was such an unusual thing for them to see that they were thinking not only for buying soap for themselves, for, uh, you know, like to, to, for washing hands or to uh, support their hygiene, but also as a present items to give somebody else's child or to bring on a date. So that was really interesting, interesting promotional, I would say, invention that uh, differentiated his manufacturing from others and from other competitors. Another thing that he also tried, it was super successful, he starts stamping soap or creating soap in the shape of letters or alphabet. So again, that becomes almost like a collectible item that people wanted to get. After the revolution, uh, factories were nationalized. And again, the, the promote of better hygiene among the po poorest social groups were on the rise. So again, the soap was sold uh, at the fraction of a price. So people actually can start using it. And then the, you know, the, the, the up shortage, you know, the kind of the, they were compensating by increasing the prices from luxury items. Any questions that you might have? I think we have one person who, uh, who has their hand raised. So I will ask them to unmute. You're just labeled iPad five. Otherwise I would say your name. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> Yes, I have two questions. One is, um, my aunt is Finnish, and from her perspective, the Finns created sauna. That's the end of the history. <laughs> so I'm not sure which country came first, or was it the tribes long before Russia was even created? I think also, like, there is, um, I think it's hard to, you know, point fingers, you know, who invented it first. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think it's also there is a difference between sauna and because they're they're like sauna and a banya and they're they're slightly different. Yes, the Finnish sauna is dry steam. That's true. Yes, so there's a dry steam and there's humid steam. Mm -hmm. But I, I think like looking back again, I'm pretty sure anybody in um, Arab. Arab cultures, they would yes. also say that they invented it first. Uh, it just has a different name. Uh, but no matter, you know, who invented it, I think it was such a great thing. <laughs> yes, I also have one more comment. Um, we visited in Turkey near Ephesus, um, mm -hmm. a, a health center, which was called Pergamon. Yes. And I can't recall the date but they had actual rooms for hot bath and then for cold bath. And then they also were treating psychological illnesses. Yes. So it was the combination which is really astonishing and something that we really need to reignite in our own culture today. Yes, no, I, I fully agree. And, 
And it's truly, you know, I, I, I've been using, you know, <laughs> sauna and banya and hammam. I think it's called hammam. Yes, um, yes. So the, you're absolutely right. You know, there are so many benefits, not mm-hmm. only for your physical health, but I mentioned for your mental health, that definitely something if we can bring it on, mm-hmm. especially nowadays, we'll all benefit from that for sure. Yes, and the Haman is very well known for men and a place for socializing, where you have all kinds of beating of the body and all of that, all these different people who are skillful in that and rubbing your body with oil. But then it's a social place for men who then bring food in and have wine, because my husband experienced that as an American, and they invited him to eat and drink with them. So it's a really very serious cultural um, ritual today. Yes, absolutely. And actually, that was one of the reasons for the decline of those uh, bathing places in medieval times, because, you know, too many people were socializing. So that's, uh-huh. that's interesting. That's something I was reading um, when I was going through the history of bathing rituals mm-hmm. in Europe and kind of the, 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 the mm-hmm. reasoning for declining of, you know, those bathing mm-hmm. houses. So all the pounds and the health that you may have achieved would be lost at the end. (laughs) So thank you very much. It's an excellent uh, presentation. No, sure. My pleasure. Um, Yes, because I'm looking at time and, oh, I probably have to speed up a little bit. You know, I wish we have more time. You know, I can spend another hour talking about it. Uh, But I wanted to make sure that we have time so I can I can walk you through and and. through the invention of synthetic soap. So you'll have a true understanding of what's the difference between detergent, detergent and the real soap. So I don't know if you, if you knew about it or not, but when you go to the store and you're looking at, you know, whatever you have on the shelf there, Sometimes you might not even see the word soap, or it might be saying something in terms of, you know, cleaning detergent or rinsing agent or um, bathing something, because it might not even contain all the ingredients of the soap itself. But first let's start about uh, talking about the history inventions. First cleaning detergent uh, was actually created in Germany under the strain of World War I because they were short on resources and they were short, it was hard to find actually, you know, like the, all the ingredients for making a real soap, which they were actually needed for, you know, for, for soldiers, for hospitals. So that's how all those inventions started. And at the end of World War II, American factories were converted to use for, uh, actually converted for, uh, to use for civil use. And that's where the home detergents were created. And by 1953, the detergent sale surpassed those of soap. And there are multiple reasons for that. First of all, it's much quicker and cheaper to create a synthetic soap because it's not really soap, it's a detergent. You can store it for a long time because despite soap, soap has an inspiration date because it's made out of oil. And if you use a cooking oil in the kitchen, you know, if if you keep it there for more than a year, that wouldn't taste right. The same thing happening with the soap. Synthetic alternatives to soap are made out of petroleum-based ingredients. So if you think about it, it's probably good, you know, to wash your clothes because it truly, you know, helps to to brighten your clothes, to remove all the dirt. But what would it do to your body if you start using that petroleum-based products on a daily basis? Because it, it, would, it, would, 
instead of actually removing only dirt or germs from your body, it would remove all the natural oil that you have. That's why you might notice that you have extremely dry skin, especially during winter time. Just looking at the time, making sure that we, 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 want, we can cover uh, also the benefits of natural soap. But more than happy to leave some time at the end, if you have other questions about synthetic detergents, um, maybe like a few things to touch uh, before we jump into the benefits of natural ingredients, that if you look at the label, there are only a few things that you should see. And the way how labels are designed nowadays, by law, you have to have a more common name and then you have a Latin name of the product that was used in creation of this, uh, of the soap or detergent. And if you'll see, um, so the common name, it's something that you should be familiar with. It should be like a tallow or olive oil, um, coconut oil, or it could be like the word lie there. If you'll see something else that you couldn't pronounce, meaning that's probably shouldn't use, or it's not truly soap. And detergents, the way how they've been invented and where you're using them, there are definitely place for them. So for example, you know, cleaning your dishes in a dishwasher because it's not harmful to your body and the, and, and the detergent would be rinsed by water, it's probably considered to be safe to use. Also like washing your clothes, depending how sensitive you are, Again, it's probably okay because it's rinsed with water, you know, it's rinsed away. But if you're applying and using something on your body, you're washing your hands, you're washing your face, you're washing your hair, that's when you might need to start paying more attention to the label itself and what it actually is. And again, I, I wish I can, I, because like my, my also like my personal interest in terms of how things were invented, um, it was quite interesting that the laundry detergent was, it was invented in 1950. And then the fa fabric softener was only invented in 1970. So you can imagine that our grand grandmothers never used any of those things. And they were using simple soap and they're drying their clothes outside. So also like now we have freedom to choose. You can do whatever you want, you know, depending on your own preferences and health benefits. But just something to remember and something to consider. There is always a place for us to use preservatives or to use synthetic alternatives to something. It's just like where it's more appropriate and where it's less appropriate. And now let's talk about benefits of a natural soap. There is no detergents. It's, uh, it is phosphate free and it only consists of uh, all the ingredients that, you know, natural ingredients, you know, such as oils that you're using in your cooking in combination with lye. The only synthetic, I would say, thing that it's actually not truly synthetic that is um, putting into the soap making nowadays is the lye. Uh, and the soap itself, the way it's created, when it's, it's a chemical reaction of combining fatty acid, oil, and the alkaline solution, lye. And that process called saponification. The different types of how we can make soap, it's either the cold process soap or the hot process soap. So traditionally hot process soap was used when you're boiling all those ingredients together. Nowadays, especially if you wanted to make soap in your kitchen, cold process is more popular because what, that's where you are just combining those ingredients and saponification would create that increased heat that happened by itself, by chemical reaction. And then you're letting that soap, like newly made soap, to cool by itself. 
Glycerin, also the result of that saponification. And if you know, like glycerin, it's that, that great substance that attracts moisture. That's when you find glycerin in most of the creams that, you know, like sold uh, at the store. And again, really interesting fact, but um, some of the most actual of the commercial soaps, they lack in glycerin because that's been extracted out of the soap in order to put, so it could be put in the cream or lotion. That's why you notice that if you're using, let's say like a liquid uh, soap that you're buying at the store, you have to follow with the cream immediately because your skin is so dry. So they're taking one important ingredient out of the soap and putting in something else. So now instead of one thing, you have to purchase two. Uh, another uh, kind of benefit of soap, you can uh, look into the properties of oil itself and what exactly you're looking for, expecting for, you know, the soap bar. If you have a dry skin, if you have sensitive skin, if you have oily hair, there are different combinations of oil or, the, or their properties bring you different benefits. Also, and let's probably go jump to the uh, next slide, kind of that the combination of those clays and herbs that would create the unique soul bar that might, might suit it for your skin type. And oils, it could be shea butter, it could be olive oil, ma mango butter, coconut oil. There are endless possibilities of different uh, combination of percentages of how those oils are combined. So you might, and oh, and another great thing that you can start adding other ingredients such as uh, milk, you can use whole milk, bring again like all the enzymes, all the vitamins into soap. You can use gold milk. You probably heard that's also like one of the uh, popular soaps nowadays. You can make it with almond milk. You can make it with any type of milk. With that being said, you know, you're using quality ingredients to end up with a quality product that wouldn't strip your, uh, your oil from your skin, that would help to moisturize and actually help to heal some of the skin conditions that you might have, such as eczema, or if you have very sensitive skin and you're reacting to those additive or synthetic ingredients in any other cl cleansing products. So that's why, uh, you know, that homemade, handmade, uh, or natural soap might be a great alternative. Something that you can try and truly experience benefit for yourself. Also, like you can notice the difference over time, you know, like even a couple of days, couple of weeks. Sometimes, you know, you'll notice it right away. Sometimes it takes time, but again, for me, it's, it's almost impossible to go back. And that's why it became my passion. Um, and like Amy mentioned, you know, it started with my own sensitive skin and my son's sensitive skin. That's how I, I kind of created my first soap with oatmeal. That was very soothing for uh, my baby son at that time, that it, uh, it truly helped to you know, he had the eczema when, or, you know, when he was little. Uh, so that truly helped. I would say like it's cured, but it, it truly helped, you know, with his condition. So just something to consider, but always remember to look in the ingredients. Because some of the labels, they might look bright and inviting, um, but it doesn't mean that it's truly, you know, like what your body needs. And with that, let's open up for questions. Um, and actually, maybe before questions, I wanted to mention one more thing uh, that I just recently, I created a new batch of soap. So if you're willing to try, uh, you can go to my website and you'll find there is a prom promo code because I truly appreciate everybody who joined my lecture today. So you can use that promo code if you wanted to 
you know, place an order, order something, and then I'll uh, send you a small gift as well. Thank you, Marina. Um, and for those of you uh, who have not tried her products yet, um, I do highly recommend it. Uh, what the One of the rose soaps is one of my favorites. Um, it is really, really nourishing because uh, I do have sensitive skin. Uh, so we can jump into, into questions. Um, since this is a, a smaller group, you know, feel free to take yourselves off mute um, and, and ask any questions you might have. Hi, this is Barbara again, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So that's other okay. people go, have go. questions. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, go okay. ahead, Barbara. I'll say last year I had a serious case of uh, dermatitis. Mm. And, I had been, and I had been traveling in developing countries and I thought, oh, well, that's it. I went to a dermatologist and uh, she recommended a very heavy duty um, prescription, which... Um, you have to use very sparingly. And then she said, if this isn't effective, then I'll put you on prednisone. Yeah. And, and right away I knew I was in trouble. So we go to an acupuncturist regularly and um, she has recommended lots of different combinations of oils mm -hmm. for, for like with joints um, to make your joints feel better, to yep. uh, use... Um, one third castor oil, two thirds grapeseed oil. Um, after a shower, especially use coconut oil. So many different of the oils that you have um, explained and um, have told us about the, the positive benefits. So I recommend highly that people experiment with them. It's really been um, transforming for me. So thank you. Yes, no, thank you. It's always like music to my ears because I've been through everything that you kind of explained, you know, like I went mm -hmm. to so many doctors and besides antibiotics or um, it, 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 any kind of like cortisone creams, there are like yes. nothing that they, can, they can offer. And then yes. this was a truly, you know, kind of going back to our roots, you know, yeah. something that was working, you know, um, and studying and kind of building that knowledge that truly really helped me and my family. Mm -hmm. That's why like, I'm happy to share my knowledge. And mm -hmm. again, I might talk for hours about the benefits of each particular oil. Mm -hmm. And I'm also really into essential oils. Oh, I, I probably didn't mention that my soap actually created with essential oils. So the uh -huh. smell yeah. that you're getting from it, mm -hmm. you know, and I brought kind of some of the samples. So this is a simple, um, bar of soap that for super sensitive skin that made with three different types of essential oils and oatmeal. So this is great mm -hmm. even for babies. It's very, very gentle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something like this, you know, that was made with eucalyptus essential oil. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And all the coloring that you see, it's actually coming from herbs, so there are no artificial uh -huh. um, color that involved here. Mm -hmm. So again, just, just trying and seeing what's best for you. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you can always, you know, and, and again, not, not to give a medical advice by any means, you know, you can always, if you feel like your condition is severe, you can always go back and, and take antibiotics mm -hmm. and do whatever, you know, is needed or prescribed by mm -hmm. your doctor but I would just recommend try more natural ways. It's almost like with herbal teas, you know, that wouldn't mm -hmm. harm yes. you. You should explore all the benefits of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two questions about banyas. Uh, so the first one is, are banyas popular all over Russia or mostly in the North? And then can we find any banyas here in Massachusetts? Okay, question number one. Yes, it's popular throughout Russia, but it's most popular, as you can imagine, in northern climates. Because if you have a long, cold winter, you know, body is something that people are looking forward. So yes, and, and, and um, in northern part of Russia, Banya, I would say, was part of everybody's household. 
So everybody should either have a banya, build a banya, or it was a common banya that was used uh, by a group of people. Great. And, and oh, the second one, yeah. um, well, but where can find binding the states? It's tough. I would say if you live near, like on the, that you can drive to Canada, I can list few places in Canada. And they actually have, like I mentioned maybe previously, they have um, kind of that black style banya uh, and the, the white style as well. So there are few places near Montreal and actually one place I can maybe like leave that info later on uh, an hour drive from the border of, uh, of you know that it's in one hour from the border so it's kind of in between this you know the, the states uh, and and the Montreal there is like a whole like there are a few villages and they have like those spas um, where they have banya Great. Uh, Natasha actually commented uh, that there are a couple of banyas in New York City that you can find. So either go to Canada or New York City. <laughs> yeah, there. I heard something. There is something in New York City, and I think it was called Turkish or I don't know. I don't know exactly. But again, like, yeah, I heard there's something in, in, in New York. Yes. We'll have to investigate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell my boss it's for it's for work. It'll be work research. <laughs> Maybe it would be like a new addition to to the museum. I'm that, pretty sure that would spark really high interest. <laughs> yes, that that would be nice. <laughs> uh, any any other questions? All right, well, if we don't have any other questions um, or if you think of something later on, uh, feel free to email me and I can contact Marina. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Marina, thank you again for this wonderful presentation and uh, stay warm everyone for who's, who's up in the Northeast as the snow keeps coming down. So, and we will um, see you at our next program. <laughs> Yes, thank you, everybody. It's really like lovely to have you here. If you have questions, you know, feel free. I don't know, you can probably send it to Amy. Amy can forward it to me. I would be more than happy to answer, you know, anything that, that you didn't have a chance to ask. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon, thank you. everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.